Hello everyone, my name's Paul Stevens, editor of Short Term Rentals, and welcome back to our Rockstars webinar series, now in our sixth series. This time it's on upsell to scale up, fresh revenue streams for STRs, sponsored by Price Labs and Minute. I'm the host for today's session. And now for a short video from our first Rockstar series. <laughs> now for a short video from our first Rockstar series sponsor, Price Labs, a revenue management tool for the short term and vacation rental industry. Check this out. So please keep your sound on mute and your camera off if you're not speaking. All of the details will be posted in the chat by my colleagues Joe and Danny throughout the session. So please do post any questions you have uh, there yourself. Finally, a recording will be sent around to everyone after today's session. And now we have one more short video from our second Rockstar series sponsor, Minute, a property monitoring company and co-host that comes for your home, guests, and community. Dear host and property managers, hosting can be difficult, we get it. Watching out for parties, making sure your guests have a wonderful stay, keeping neighbors happy, coordinating cleaning and security staff. We see all the work you do every day and we wanna help. Wouldn't it be great to have a co-host? Someone to welcome your guests when they arrive, remind them about house rules when they're getting a bit too loud. Keep your home safe when they leave. We're Minute, the co-host that helps you care for your home, guests, and community. We come highly recommended. We're reliable and we're eager to help. So let us be your co-host today. With love, Minute. And a big thank you to Price Labs and Minute for sponsoring this uh, Rockstars webinar series. So let's introduce our lineup for today and we'll kick off uh, with Annie, please. Hi, everybody. I'm Annie Sloan from The Host Co. And uh, at The Host Co, uh, we help host some property managers uh, create a digital store and upsell items from rentals to in-home items to services, uh, even to alterations. So. We help you make a, a simple web link that you can share in, in any PMS, in any OTA, uh, and add items, even possibly from uh, everyone here at this, this webinar. So we will see about that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Annie. I'm very happy to have you on today's session. Uh, next up, we have Eric from OK to Charge. Thank you, Paul. Excited to be here. Uh, my name is Eric Broughton. I am the CEO of OK to Charge. We are an electric vehicle charging platform for the vacation industry, we integrate with your property management systems to make sure that the right people can charge their vehicles at the right time. So you just don't have Uber drivers pulling up and charging at your property. And then also we create that into an ancillary revenue, which I hope to speak about a little bit more about that today. So thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, next up, we have Matt. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, my name is Matthew Loney. I'm the president and CEO of Explory. Uh, we're the largest guest experience provider to the U.S. vacation rental industry. Our solutions are the only uh, current solutions that can connect vacation rentals directly to the local activities and attractions in ways that not only uh, help the host win and keep guests, but also create operational efficiencies. Uh, everything from on-demand concierge service to the industry's first voice enabled in room concierge service. Um, our services are in about 60 markets here in the US and um, across about uh, 15,000 US vacation rails. And we're excited that to be expanding in the fall with our first uh, six partners in the UK. So that'll be that'll be fun. I'm, I'm already <laughs> leaning on Paul for all the inside <laughs> knowledge. 
<laughs> looking forward to it, Matt. And of course, finally, we have Mark. Yeah, hey everyone. I'm the CEO of Minoan. Uh, you can think of us as a platform to manage all the stuff that needs to go in your rental that makes it so that your guests aren't sitting in an empty home. So everything from upstream, saving uh, host 50 to 60% off on plates, mattresses, linens, mugs, all the stuff you need there. And then we have a component where we, we then build the store as well, where we sell those products to guests. So if the guest has a really nice sleep, um, wants to buy the mattress, you know, we manage that whole process, the sell, the sale to them. And we do a 50, 50 profit share with our hosts. Um, and that part is sort of the incremental revenue stream that we'll, yeah, we'll get into today. Thank you very much to, um, to all of you um, for taking part today. So it feels as if we've been covering a number of raises and launches of e-commerce platforms and marketplaces this year. We've got Glimpse, Showplace and the Host Co represented uh, latterly by Annie. Um, I've all raised seed funding this year while Inhaven launched only last month and Mark's Minoan uh, also raised $5 million in seed funding back in February. Uh, Matt's company, Explory, has been busy adding to its senior team this year with the appointments of a new VP of Activity Partnerships, CTO, CFO, uh, Vice President of B2B Product Marketing and Director of Software Engineering. And I'm sure we can touch a little bit more on that uh, in today's discussion. And finally, the growing popularity of value added services for the guest experience is something we predicted at the back end of last year as well, both in our annual predictions piece and our trendsetters webinar with uh, founder of uh, Mount, Maddie Rifkin, you can see that on the screen. And you can find the link to that discussion uh, in the comments as well during this session. So let's move on to, uh, to today's discussion. We'll get straight in. And I'm going to turn first to, uh, to you, Matt. Um, and I think you can offer quite a unique perspective as well to our panel. You yourself uh, with Explory are a guest experience solution and you're you know, working to help lodging providers leverage these local tours and attractions. So when we look at how the hosts are now finding new means to find revenue, I'm wondering, do you think that the pandemic has actually played a major role in this sort of shift or acceleration? What, what, what do you think? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, I actually, I don't. I, I think if we really went back, I think this trend started well before the pandemic. Uh, you can look at some of the OTAs and, and what Airbnb did with their experiences platform, um, what uh, Booking.com was doing through their uh, acquisition of Fair Harbor. I think this industry has understood for a long time that it, it's selling an experience through the home. And you know, it, I think what's happened really are two things. One is the proliferation of the uh, revenue management has really what I would say, you know, for a short period there, I think the early adopters saw big lifts, but now you've really across the board from the smallest, you know, single unit host operators to your largest, they're all managing their, their yield pretty well through you know, Price Labs and, and a couple of the other big players in the market. And so because of that, they're now the, the operators are having to look for, again, kind of how do I differentiate? How do I drive that ancillary revenue? And I think lucky for them in those last three or four years when we went through the pandemic, the technology has continued to improve. Um, groups like you've got here on the panel, um, and and some you mentioned, you know, Mount's another one, In Haven's another one. You start to see there's quite a few coming up, and that wasn't available three or four years ago. So I think it's just that they're meeting at the perfect intersection here of needing to find now that additional revenue and the technology that can deliver it. Mm. And exactly like you say, I think the fact that we're all on this panel and we're having this discussion is is evidence of of this trend as well, yeah. um, as, as we've mentioned, of course, in, in the context. And you yourself mentioned uh, the concept of, of revenue management. Are there any other factors or anything else that you think have accelerated this trend and, and made these additional revenue sources more feasible operationally? 
No, I mean, again, I think the tech, and then I think now what you're seeing, because I think this is the third panel, Eric and I have sat on together just <laughs> on this topic alone. I, I think too, the, with the economy across the, you know, across the world, occupancy slowing down, ADRs now starting to slow, although they held for a little longer compared to occupancy. So now you've got people looking into the future, now only thinking, okay, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to grab additional revenue where I can, but I've also mm. got to differentiate because there was a period there where it, it was tough to push your ADR any higher. Every time you thought you pushed it to its highest point, more people book. And I think with the slowdown of staff at that point, it was tough to maybe focus on some of these ancillary revenue opportunities. But now that things are returning to a little bit more of a seasonal uh, norm, I think people are refocusing on, okay, how do I differentiate and, and where are these ancillary revenue opportunities? Thank you very much, Matt. And mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll turn to Annie next as well. Um, you're, um, you know, with the Host Co as well. That's another company that we've mentioned raising seed funding early this year. I think it was 1.85 million, um, mm -hmm. if I'm correct there. So for those of us uh, maybe tuning in today who aren't aware of the Host Co, could you just explain to us uh, what your business model is essentially and how it differs from the from the competition yeah um so with the host co uh again we're, we're helping um, um hosts and property managers create a unique store for every single rental so the process is your guest books uh they then get through your ota automated message hey if you need anything before you arrive we have a store then you can send a message an hour after they check in. Hey, if you need anything, we have a store midway through this day. So how our services, there's definitely, you know, we have some overlapping territories, but what we've focused on is that guest hierarchy of needs, right? So I want to impress somebody. I'm bored. I'm hungry. I can't sleep. Um, I checked in and, uh, oh my gosh, I forgot my phone charger and I'm definitely not sharing it with my partner the entire weekend, right? Um, I'm hungover. If you go out for a big night at a wedding, you will pay 50 bucks for Advil and Gatorade the next day. I think almost all of us have been there, right? You're in bed, you're like, oh my God, can someone just bring it to me, right? Um, so we started our service with that in mind, with the guest needs throughout the cycle of their stay and meeting those needs uh, during those times, all the way from, hey, I just booked. Um, we have uh, services. I think that's a little bit different than Almost everyone here, you know, you have experiences. We have a lot of in-home services that we connect. We have property managers who have connected a tattoo artist for bachelor parties. Hey, book a tattoo artist. They'll come in and do tiny tattoos for everyone. A property manager that's added beer burrows. Literally get two donkeys with saddlebags full of beer to come into the house, right? All the way through, um, through obviously wellness. So you have those pre-order items all the way through um, mid-state clean, uh, late checkout, et cetera. So it's often those for us right now, it's those smaller players who have between probably two and 20 rentals that are just experimenting with, um, with how they want to monetize their space and how they want to make it a value add um, company. What we've noticed also is throughout the pandemic, it's funny because uh, Matt, I was going to say the same thing. It actually hasn't changed that much, but the thing that has changed mm. is there's a lot more millennials coming on as homeowners and there's a lot more tech native guests who are expecting more and expecting these things to already be there and we're really playing into that mm, thank you annie and yeah. judging by the grins on some of our other panelists i think that <laughs> certainly resonates with uh what we're all seeing but you know something you know we, we've spoken before and had various conversations and i'm always really fascinated by your background as well and i'm if you can explain a little bit about that and also you know, why did you launch the host co at the time you did so prior to the host co, um, I was, I'm coming from a tech background. I was a creative director at Facebook. Prior to that, I was a creative director at Twitter. I made Bay Area eye roll. Like if you, if you threw a dart, I've been, been embedded at Google, been embedded at Airbnb, um, et cetera. I'm also a host and I've been a host since, since Airbnb started. Prior to Airbnb, I was renting out my apartment on Craigslist, which was very sketchy. I will, I was like, give me a send me a picture of your license like that's gonna do that does not right does nothing but i have been uh, an early adopter of this for a long time uh my co-founder runs a property management company 
And he came to me a couple of years ago and he said, our guests, when they check in, it's a sunk cost. They crank up the AC and they break all the wine glasses, right? I mean, they're a wonderful guest. We want to provide a great hospitality experience, uh, but they're also asking us throughout the entirety of their stay. You can almost predict what they're going to ask and when they're going to ask it, depending on obviously their location, the size of their party, right? Um, where can I get firewood after we've already burnt through all the firewood you have? And it's 1 a.m. and they're asking your property manager, right? Um, where can we get beer that's close by? Uh, we um, we have a property in Death Valley. Where can I get chapstick? And you're 30 miles from the nearest store, right? So just saying, how do we meet the customer's need along this journey? So the first thing I did was go and look and say, why doesn't this exist, right? Because a lot of this stuff, it's a no-duh idea, right? It, this should have been done a long time ago. Obviously, hotels know you're selling the experience, not the room, right? Uh, and it's just the technology. Again, as Matt said, the technology just has not been able to catch up. You need not only um, automation with all these third-party services, you need some machine learning about what's going to sell where and be able to suggest that throughout the process. So that is my long way to say, quit my job at Facebook, uh, started working on community, uh, and uh, started building a product. Thank you very much, Annie. And uh, I'm talking of interesting backgrounds. Eric, you yourself, a former CEO and co-founder of a company that was uh, acquired by uh, Expedia Group, and now you've gone into uh, designing what you call the first fully automated EV charging solution for the vacation rental industry. So what have you seen in terms of bookings with OK to charge? It's still a, a relatively nascent industry and something that we're starting to hear more about. Yeah, it's, it's a, you know, I'm not a, an accounting major or econ, but, the, you know, you have to see enough data points to, to call it a trend. So what I have right now is more anecdotal evidence because um, in the States, uh, we're only about 5% of car sales are now electric vehicles, but that is also the point where you have the early adopters where it transitions into more of that growth curve of, um, uh, of adoption. So we're starting to see that occur. What we're having is we have clients that have installed their chargers at their properties. First and foremost, they set themselves apart from the rest of the other properties in the area. You might be in the Hilton Head and you're able to get a booking because you're now not 4,000 properties that are available, you're four or eight. Uh, so you're seeing that. We're seeing higher ADR as well. And then the flip side, the point of this presentation and, and why we're having these conversations is the ancillary, ancillary income. I'll be able to practice that and say it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Extra income. <laughs> it's, uh, we're going to see an uptick in that. And we're seeing properties that say, you know, I'm going to charge $25 per charging activity. And we've somebody had $150 of extra revenue for one person's stay where they would not have had. And in addition, you have to recover these costs. These are real electricity costs. You don't give away free gasoline at your properties. Most people, you know, Annie hit it on the head. You're using up all the firewood. You're using up all the all the you know consumable items there. You have to return that. Well, that's a cost to the owner, and it's our job as property managers to assist them to recover those costs. Mm. It's just like you say. And how do you ensure that this these additional revenue streams are actually useful to the traveler, um, actually valuable to the traveler rather than just something that's sort of you might use once or, or twice or yeah. yeah. That, that's absolutely the, the right question and that and that you have to provide the right experience for your guests and those mm -hmm. travelers. Otherwise they're not going to return. So that's where it's so important to work with partners that have been in this industry. Um, I think Annie nailed it again. You have to have experience. She's had experience being a host. That's why I see a lot of the Silicon Valley or even East Coast uh, uh, platforms fail is because they don't have that experience being hosts and, and managing it. So they have these big ideas and say, we're going to do this and change the world. And, you know, it's it's uh, the WeWork guy and doing some fancy thing. And that just doesn't work, you know, because you don't understand the nuances of this business. Uh, so we'll have clients that if someone's paying $20,000 a week for a property, they do not want to pay another $100 for charging. Mm. That's going to be included. Right. But at the same time, they don't want an Uber driver and his Tesla three pulling up and charging it in their parking spot. So that's where we just do access control and not the extra revenue. So we, we, we make sure that we adopt our platform to match the unique needs of those hosts and the property managers. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, for that. And, and Mark, I mean, you're 
your background as well is equally interesting. You've got, um, I believe, quite a, a retail background, or you've worked with, with Walmart, you've worked with Jet.com, to now you've just raised $5 million in, in seed funding, so quite considerable as well. But you're trying to do something quite different, I know, and trying to evolve this retail experience. I don't know if this term in particular of native retail is something that you've coined yourself, but could you explain to us about what, what this means and where you fit into that customer journey? Yeah, of course. So I, I, yeah, I did work, I was an early employee at a company called Jet.com, which was an e-commerce marketplace um, that 18 months after launch sold to Walmart for $3.3 .3 billion. So it's a really unique experience. But the, to be honest, the biggest takeaway from working at Jet and then Walmart, where I managed a, a sizable business, was that the best product experiences, they don't actually happen on screens the way they do in e-commerce, and they don't happen on shelves in aisles and stores the way they do in brick and mortar. They happen in real moments of use. And so in my day job, I was seeing all these brands spending, you know, I mean, spending billions of dollars um, to try and create meaningful moments on Google, on Facebook, you know, to have an ad be displayed. Um, and we looked at the hosting community and we're like, well, wait a minute. If like, if Casper is paying $7 for a click on Google, like what's it worth to have someone come in and actually sleep on that mattress three or four nights in a row, you know? Um, and this is true of any product that exists in the physical world. Like it's better to use it. It's better to use a Peloton and see how you like it than yeah. scroll through pictures on a screen. It's better to brew a cup of coffee and see how it tastes. And so that's what we mean when we talk about native retail. And we think that um, but retail is a big category. I mean, it's a quarter of our GDP. Uh, we like to buy a lot of stuff. Um, and so when we think about the moments that happen between people and products in these spaces, and, and it's the same stuff that hosts need to buy to furnish their properties. We just think there's a lot of value and money in there that hosts aren't necessarily capturing mm. right now. And there's a host of technology you need to build, um, to be able to offer brands sort of the data and infrastructure that they're used to getting from these big players. And so that's what we're really passionate about is uh, I think hosts are very aware of, of the experience economy and monetizing that. And I think that there's even uh, there's even more ways to monetize the experience economy than they are currently through these uh, selling additional services. But the attention economy is uh, another big one. There's big dollars in the attention economy. Again, Google and Facebook print tens of billions of dollars every quarter in profits. Um, and we think that hosts have really unique, valuable moments of attention. And we want to help them, you know, get a piece of that, you know, all the money that's flowing these big players. Like we actually think that uh, these brands could get more value piping some of that into, into hosts and, you know, their hospitality professionals. Exactly. And there was, it kind of mirrors a previous quote I'd, I'd seen from you. You said that product experiences don't happen on screens and shelves, but in the wild. So is that reflective of how hosts have had to be creative to find or create these additional revenues? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you asked earlier why this is such a hot topic. And I think we're also just reaching uh, a level of the maturity curve in this industry where you start to look at other sources of monetization. Mm. I mean, this is, um, when you look at industries that grow really, really quickly and, mm. all, and this industry is still growing very, very quickly, you look no further than, you know, Airbnb's <laughs> earnings reports to, to see that. I think, uh, you know, same thing happened in e-commerce. It's like, as markets get saturated, you need to differentiate in different ways and uh, becomes a market where like, you know, squeezing out some extra dollars every month gives you a big leg up and allows you to differentiate. And so I think that's why this is timely. It's just that this market has reached um, its point on the maturity curve where this makes sense. Uh, when an industry is just ripping um, and it's not saturated, it's like, you can just, you just focus on one, your primary revenue stream. But as this happens, you focus on, on more. And obviously there are a lot of great entrepreneurs uh, who are trying to help uh, hosts figure that out. Mm. Um, you know, and four of them are, are on this call. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Mark. And um, let's go a bit deeper into the sorts of products or services either that you're showcasing or that we're seeing generally with it in the industry. And, and Annie, um, I think you're, you're a perfect example. Mark, 
there cited the attention economy. And I think that mirrors something that you wanted to come in as well. And what are some of the most popular up upsells that you're seeing and, and, and why do you think they're so popular? I'm happy to jump. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah sorry, sorry that was for you, Alex. Um, uh, the, the biggest selling items for us right now, we're seeing definitely late checkout, which some, you know, some PMS can do, but that is very popular fresh flowers before arrival, which you can automate to a third party, uh, birthday party decor, you know, things that again, um, set you apart from something else or that provide a unique experience. Um, strangely yoga mats, if you can sell, if you have a yoga mat, it will sell anything wellness. You know, if you look at upsells in um, hotels, I think like 30, 40% of upsells is now wellness in that space. So if you can capitalize on that. Um, and then things that um, things that are stocked in the home that you forget, those are very big, like um, uh, sunblock, full-size sunblock, phone chargers, sun hats, things like that. Those are the, the lower priced items. Uh, the larger being those services. Also uh, mid-stay clean is a very big one. And now we are introducing laundry service with companies that will of course pick it up and, and bring it back. That's also absolutely huge. Um, I look at this from a perspective. So there's this thing that's uh, this quote that uh, moms never go on vacation. They only go on trips, right? And I'm sure the same with dads too, but you don't wanna do the dishes. You don't wanna do the cooking. You don't wanna do the laundry. And often that's why you choose a hotel instead, right? As you get older and also you have your more money, hey, I, I want all these services to already be there. So any service that can replace that um, is, a, is a real big seller for us. Mm, thank you very much, Annie. And uh, Mark, similarly, you, I think, partner with is it over 200 brands as well. Could yeah. you tell us a little bit more um, about these, the, the sort of products that you're seeing most demand for at the moment? Of course. Yeah. Bedding is big and bedding is also actually pretty big money. I mean, the way that we're structured, we do a 50, 50 profit share with our hosts. So, and I mean, the way that we approach this is that you should be saving money on the stuff you buy and earning income on the stuff you sell. Cause if you really believe that the moments between people and products in these spaces are valuable and that these hosts are actually marketing partners of brands, not just customers for these brands to make money off of, you have to attack it on both sides. And so we'll save them a lot of money. You know, we can help hosts get say 50, 60% on mattresses, and then they can earn with some of our partners, like 20, 25% commission sales full retail. So it's like, if you buy a mattress and then over the course of the next two years, you sell two of them, it's paid for itself. And it's actually now a net profitable asset in the property. And so bedding is a big one that, um, you know, moments of inspiration strike when you, if you wake up and you're like, I slept really well, what is this? And that's also before we even work with hosts, we hear them telling us, that's what everyone asked me about where I got the beds, where I got the linens. Uh, we've noticed a lot in the kitchen area. So, um, we've had some hosts because they can save so much on these nicer, like, uh, pots and pans, brands like Caraway or our place is a great partner of ours. Um, they're buying stuff that they might not have bought originally if it was full retail. Cause it's like, well, I don't want to buy this super nice. Mm. Like, I don't know if these people are going to treat it well, but because you can earn commissions on it, like the lifetime economics actually work out. And so cookware, fellow tea kettles, I don't know if you've seen they're like these beautiful kettles with this little gooseneck. I actually fell victim. I stayed at a property and ended up buying one. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, there's all sorts of, I mean, all sorts of stuff. The weirdest one has been little hanging hooks. So we um, we uh, helped the host procure a bunch of hanging hooks for like an entryway where people could hang coats. And I almost, when our team was assembling it, I was like, well, we shouldn't even add that to the shoppable side. Like who's going to buy hanging hooks? It's ridiculous. And then lo and behold, a couple months later, someone bought four hanging hooks because they wanted to recreate that in their home. So um I think, and, and Annie gave a ton of examples, things that like I wasn't even thinking about. I think that like um, to narrow the focus on like a few things is a disservice. I mean, uh, electric car charging, selling experiences, like it, it really, I think hosts need to start viewing their spaces, not just in terms of like um, the rent or the uh, ADR, what they make for the booking, but also like, um, 
what is what are the needs of that guest in that time? What's going to be convenient to them? And you can build a really strong ancillary revenue strategy um, around that. Yeah. Um, and there's there's good there's really good um, examples of this in uh, like high end boutique hospitality. Like there are um, that's where I sort of look where I'm like, wow, they're really doing like cool stuff and leading the charge. Like some places where you can rent a Tesla. Like you literally just tell them you want the Tesla and someone like drops, you know, <laughs> two, two cars come, one person gets in the other car and they leave and they just give you the keys. And um, so, yeah, I think to narrow just on a few successful things would, would you, you should really take a broad approach and then just see what guests resonate with, you know, and, and, and lean into that. I think, I think I you think hit it on the head, Mark. It's, it's uh, you look at the experiences and there's all these new travelers and guests coming to our vacation industry. Uh, that are normally hotel stairs or boutique hotel stairs, and they already have an expectation in mind. You know, we were talking about this actually before the call a little bit and how, you know, some people, I think they don't want to show up and do chores, right? They don't want to, I, I want to have this experience. And now we have these new people, which we want as an industry, but they have an expectation mindset that's a little bit different than the average, you know, mom and dad going to the Outer Banks in North Carolina. It's a different experience. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. And I mean, Eric, as soon as you've come in on that point, I think oh. it links quite well with what with Mark saying, at least hinting at it there. But there's also a key sustainability consideration to to come into Absolutely. effect. How how do you view that in terms of what the demand is there for? Absolutely, it's another demand item that is slowly starting to progress and gaining momentum based on you know what's happening in our environment and the world as it is today. You're seeing more sustainability practices and, and how you market that. And it's not just EV charging. It goes beyond that. It's, it's uh, what do you use to clean your sheets and uh, how, where are you getting your electricity and how are people getting to your property and what are you, you know, are, do you have water, watering a grass area in Phoenix, Arizona, or do you have the kind of the, the fake grass and the putting green type thing? I think, you know, Mark and Annie's platform where you're able to, to look at these and say, hey, I'm going to even buy sustainable items. Maybe you have that green icon that's going to come. And then Matt's going to be able to say, oh, yeah, here's an eco-friendly activity that you can do. And, and, and that's a difference because uh, but I would say the consumer is and the travelers and guests are not quite there in mass yet. So it goes back to those niches. So you're starting to get those niches. I think it's more than five percent as far as people that want the sustainability. But again, that's growing. And if you provide that accessibility, they're going to come. And I'll go back to one more concept that I had top of mind. So I just want to throw yeah. out there that the main thread that I'm seeing between Mark, Matt, and Annie is our technology enablement. You know, it's no different than you couldn't have Uber without the iPhone. I'm blurring it out. You couldn't have Uber without that. You know, now with QR codes and, and Matt's using uh, Amazon, you know, Echo and, and Annie's using all the e-commerce that she's brought in that, that knowledge without that, that continuance of technology, that amalgamation of, of opportunity, we don't have this. So we have a very unique timing where we're merging and, and having that intersection. And that's that's where it's exciting. And that's where you start to see this, you hit on all, all those all those fundraising rounds. There's a lot of money coming in because there's gaps there and there's very unique solutions to be had. So people are seeing this opportunity. So it's growth in many sectors. So it's, it's very exciting. Yeah, Absolutely. I think that that's a really good point because it's, it's, I don't know if any of us are doing things that have never been done before. Eric, maybe you right. are. Yours seems infrastructurally a little more complicated. <laughs> but at least for for uh, Annie, Matt, and myself, it's like there have been hosts who have done these things. You know, they have sold experiences on their own. They have uh, made their property shoppable. They've added these services. But the problem is, it's like a ton of work. And yes. so the hosts, you know, it's like you get your hands full just dealing with the guests. So the thought of like adding on this other work, um, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. One of the beautiful things about technology is that it can be used to make complicated tasks frictionless and scalable. And so these things that um, historically you could always do, but it would have taken a major effort. Now you, with, with platforms that exist today, it's like, oh, actually it's a little bit more plug and play. Um, and I think that's also why the interest in ancillary revenue now, it's like, well, Mm -hmm. I've always been interested in it, but before I would have to like, you know, build this, you know, build all these relationships with, 
with local restaurants and figure out a kickback program. And I'd have to build right. a Shopify store and I'd have to yeah. manually route the order and I'd have to support the order. And if they want to return. And so um, I think technology just reducing the effort is, is part yeah. of what make, it's making it so interesting. Um, and also making the, the opportunity set in yeah. these sorts of revenue streams much larger. Yeah. And we succeed by pressing the easy button for everybody, right? Because it's, they just, to your point, they can't scale. You, you, hey, I have two properties, you know, in, in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Hey, Casper, can I work together? No, <laughs> it's yeah. not going to work. Or you're like Matt trying to do experiences. It's, it's not. You just can't scale that without a platform, without professional growth. And, and we've seen competitors uh, to each of us, uh, you know, that that we've seen fail because they try to put the work on the PMs. Yeah, and 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 Matt, so I, I think you've been making a couple of notes um, in in between listening to these people, <laughs> listening to your fellow panelists as well. But I think you're well positioned as well, both to look at it from an operational and also from an ancillary amenity perspective. So, from from the tours attractions pers perspective, what what are you saying here? Yeah, I yeah, I'm taking a lot. Of, I feel like I've been more. <laughs> you, this is great, though. I, this is perfect. This is what I wanted. Um, no, I think everybody made a lot of good points. I think when property managers think about ancillary revenue, it's it's really important to one, think about scalability. Um, and if you're going to try and making sure you, if you're going to do it on your own, that you understand the economics. Uh, not all ancillary revenue is created equal, right? Um, so, but also I think, and, and Eric brought this up earlier, really thinking about how we price this. And we can learn from some of the larger players. Uh, Marriott is a great example. I'm sure at some point they have, but I'm a, you know, when I stay in a Marriott, I've never received an email that asked me for late checkout, you know, for $25. But, but you can sure believe that it is a major piece of their loyalty program. And, and so understanding which things you can bundle either to differentiate to drive higher ADR like Eric was talking about, um, or to create that loyalty and understanding what that lifelong value of that guest is. And then, but also what is kind of outside of the norm and that people are willing to pay extra for, that they understand that their request is not a normal one for maybe somebody who's staying in this home. So I think those are two things, you know, to explore We look at it a little bit differently in that. And I think, experience is probably more than anything here, although Eric's is probably close. It tells you a lot about your guests. And it's an area where I think we've still got a lot of work to do in, um, in the vacation rental industry, where we are still very hyper-focused on my owner relationship, right? Because I need that product. But yet, when you, when you hear these vacation rental managers talk about their guest acquisition strategy versus their owner strategy uh, acquisition, it's a little blur more blurry. You'll mm -hmm. hear them talking about, well, I'm really good on Airbnb and Verbo, you know, and, and quick to remind, that's a distribution strategy. It's not an owner. So I think across all these products, I think one of the opportunities is if you can really start to store that data of who is buying what, um, it tells you a lot about your guests. And as we as we enter this time of the book direct movement and people really understanding the value of reducing that guest acquisition cost, the, the strength of being able to build retargeting campaigns and drip campaigns around something more than this guest likes to stay in product in this range at this time and give them a discount. Can you talk to them more about the activities they're enjoying while they're there, the products they've bought in the past, you know, the fact that you've got an EV charger to somebody who has an EV car, like th that right there, the ancillary value is huge. And so I think it's just be careful that it's not always about the immediate, how much money can I make today? Although I think mm. on a lot of these products, that's really important because it's kind of a, with a bed, a once in a 10 year purchase. But a lot of it is, hey, am I, what can I do with this data to make money years, you know, for, for the next few years as I get this guest to come back? Excellent. Thank you very much for your insights, Matt. And Annie, I know you're 
using your leveraging data and automation as well at the host co and you know how how are you how exactly can you explain how you're using this to suggest upsells and uh, how much incremental revenue do you think hosts can actually make from upselling using this um so i'll start with that so our top sellers right now are making six thousand dollars a year in upsells uh because they are uh monetizing that stream primarily themselves we do have third-party vendors but um you can connect uh, your chef, your massage therapist, your guy that does a two hour tiki bar, you can pay him $200 and you can charge $400. Right. And that's, that's all automated. So, um, it's a pretty, pretty great revenue stream. And as, as we go, as we see more purchasing data, we then improve, Hey, here's what you can sell. Here's a partner for you, mm. et cetera. Um, and you know, six grants, nothing to sneeze at, but then you got 30 rentals. That's you know, you're making a whole lot of money, 200 K plus a year right in those upsells um for us right now so we launched in march of this year to the public we were in beta in listings before that um so a lot of that you know we use a lot of it's uh, let's have two uh, two hours to talk about all the like the retool and the, we won't go into that stuff but um right now we're looking at that primarily regionally uh and we have our team literally just looking at the sales data every day so some of that we're doing manually to make sure we're capturing the data and then uh, crunching those numbers along the way. Um, and then we also are able to suggest um, vendor partners uh, per zip code. So hosts can then find what is in their area. And what that does also is it creates the ecosystem with local service providers that, that we vet. Uh, you know, so we're not doing, you know, we're not saying, uh, why don't you go down to Uber and pick up an Uber? We're saying this is an incredible local experience. Um, and for us, it's kind of the same thing, you know, Good hospitality is good marketing. Just to go back to that, what we like to say is never nickel and dime anybody. Don't say, do you want a granola bar for $5, right? Or, oh, a toothbrush for $6, right? Uh, bundle those items. You need a case of water, right? You need an entire beach setup that you should rent. Um, and make sure with all these upsells that that is going to make it, what we like to say is it should make it into their review. You saved my life. You had kids, go you had kids sand toys. I was going crazy, right? Um, so at every point, and um, we're also looking at that again through what is the right time of the guest journey, approaching it with, I have the solution right before you ask me. And that includes, oh my God, I just woke up. I had the best night's stay. What's this mattress, right? Having that solution so that it truly just looks like a value add throughout the entirety of the stay rather than ever saying, do you want to buy something? Mm. Thank you. Thank Annie, you. Yeah. To, Matt, Matt said something that was equally scary, but equally exciting. And I think with your background <laughs> on Facebook is going to be fascinating. So when do you <laughs> see a day when you'll know, you know, do I have an EV car? Who did I vote for in the last election? <laughs> oh, let's not talk too much about politics. So, so <laughs> you know, like, when does when when do you see that type of data integration happening, where you could project what your what your um, guests are experiencing? Do they have kids, and then do they need what ages are the kids? That's fast. Like I said, fascinating. And yeah, what do you what's the timing on that? Oh gosh, well. I think the the true art of that is making it look a value add and not creepy. And there's a really fine line. Wow. All of us have been like, oh, awesome. I was just talking about that. And then 20 minutes later, you get served up something and you're real creeped <laughs> out. Um, so, I mean, quite a bit of that you can put on just the type of space that they're renting, okay. right? Um, and we are not doing any, any sort of pixel tracking on customers currently, uh, okay. but we are learning most importantly, I think all of us as hosts, you can basically, you're like, oh man, they want this again, or they broke the hot tub again at 2 a.m., right? That the longer you have that, those patterns start to emerge and you can, okay. yeah, you can predict what they're going to need throughout the entire their stay. We have um, a host in North Carolina. It's all anonymous, right? So I can't yes. tell anything, but um, she is selling North Carolina state Christmas ornaments and like, they're just flying out the door. So I'm assuming that every every single person coming there is dropping their kid off at school, right? Um, so just knowing those things to monetize, and then we can we can expand that in that geographic area. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, well, you came in there, Eric, as well, and it was, and uh, I can't remember if it had been mentioned before, but you were seeing property manager margins getting squeezed a lot. That's a big um, talking point at the moment. So mm. 
how do you see additional revenue streams benefiting uh, different property managers' business models? Yeah, absolutely. I'll go back to something Matt touched on in the beginning. You know, there, there, was, there was the new normal, which is the pandemic for about three years. And if you were a beach or mountain, your ADRs were off the charts, right? It was, we're starting to slip back to the old normal. I consider myself uniquely qualified to talk about this because the division I had at Expedia Group was about getting more urban core inventory, which was shut down because of the pandemic, but now it's coming back. All right. So, so now people are saying, hey, you know what? Let's go to Nashville. We're just talking about conferences in Nashville. That was not as exciting a little while ago. It was more like the, you know, the Smoky Mountains. And now all of a sudden people are going to Nashville. They're going to Chicago, New York City, Austin. These urban core are popping up. So now if you're a beach or mountain resort, you already, you start, you have to battle again. Grand, there's more travelers and more guests, but, and, and I think AirDNA does a great job with this. You know, um, Key Data does this at our at conferences. They talk about, and it's getting more difficult to win that, that, that next ADR level. We're actually seeing that even retract a little bit in some markets. Um, I'll talk a little bit about EV charging. I just worked with a, a great revenue management company we're going to do a formal blog in this in the future, but we're seeing for those that have an electric vehicle charger at the property, their ADR on average across the U.S. is 12% higher. So a 12% ADR lift just by having that EV charger. And I think each of us in the panel have opportunities where we can say it's either your ADR is increasing uh, or your occupancy is increasing because you have this niche or your property management company revenue stream is, is increasing. So you got to, and it takes work and it takes finding the right partner. And that's really what we're all about today. So it's, it's a very exciting time. Yeah. Thank you very much, Eric. And a similar question really to, to Mark as well. Um, what do you see as being the, the, ben the economic benefits for property managers with upselling? Are you seeing um, particular demand? It, uh, what, what are your top markets, would you say as well? Well, our top markets are, I mean, we are a couple of years old and so we we saw a lot of these like secondary these markets outside of primary cities so like hamptons upstate new york joshua tree mm -hmm. fredericksburg texas um have been big big markets for us so i think that um yeah it's been it, it's it's been interesting I mean, when we talk about working with hosts to improve the economics of their business we really do mean every element of it and so it's not just like oh you could buy this coffee maker because you know if you sell three of them the next year it'll pay for itself it's like what is the value of adding a high-end espresso machine to your listing is there data that shows that you can actually squeeze out an extra ten dollars in adr if that's true this thing actually pays for itself in like a month and a half you know um and so that's why we attack it from both sides it's like it's also thinking about what you're furnishing and putting into the rental how does that impact ADR? Um, when does that get recouped? How does, what's the lifetime value? When, what's the payback period based on conversion that we see where you'd sell enough so that it'd pay for itself. And when you combine those two, I mean, it's a compounding, like the increase in ADR and the recurring revenue, it makes a big difference. And so when we, you know, it's, it's, it's getting competitive for sure. Like um, this industry, the housing costs haven't really, um settled yet as much as uh, i think some people were expecting there's uh, a lot of competition in these markets and so what we preach is like what is your differentiation going to be um and we think that if you're saving you know if you're getting 50 percent off on all the stuff you're bringing into your property and you can furnish it nicely and drive a higher adr and you can earn some revenue from selling these items it's like everyone else who's trying to you just have a massive economic advantage over everyone else it's like um it's like how amazon in the early days amazon's real estate costs were warehouses in the middle of nowhere where the dollar per square foot was super low but walmart and target were getting you know they're they're paying high premium dollar per square foot in these not urban but suburban areas like so that's what we really preach is change the economics of your business um, and there's lots of ways that you can do that outside of what what we preach but i think that's where it's not going to get any less competitive. Like there's institutional money flowing into this space now. There's uh, big REITs, big companies that have typically done long-term rentals. They're looking at short-term like, well, wait a minute, I could rent this out for 
five thousand four thousand a month in a long-term rental but oh my god this is 11 12 for short-term rental okay well what's the incremental and so there's more money flowing into this space and so being really intentional and deliberate about like what is your market who is your core audience what is important to them do you is your core user you know maybe if you're in one of these luxury markets outside of a primary city is your core user someone that's likely to have a tesla likely to be a peloton member likely to want to go on a paddleboarding tour in the ocean okay think about that package it together and make it perfectly tailored um to that user again it's just part of this industry maturing there being more competition and so you kind of have to up your game and, and approach it a little bit differently than you have in the past i think that it's exactly that and that also feeds into this yeah maturation standardization of the whole guest experience um matt i know you've got the the guest x podcast of podcast I'd thoroughly recommend and I'm not just saying that because I was on it once as well um <laughs> but but you're talking about um you know not just short-term rentals but hotels as well how do you see perhaps or how do you evaluate or assess what the short-term rental industry can learn from say the hotel industry when it comes to value-added amenities Is, are, are we well positioned to take advantage I think we are. We've we've certainly got more space now. We've got you know typically less common areas. I think you you, you know it, interestingly you're seeing Marriott Homes and Villas do a nice job. Uh, one of the pilots I've seen with them is when you're staying in homes now. You um, in some cities you actually have the ability to go and use some of the shared amenities at the local Marriott hotels. You know what? So if you don't have a gym, if you don't have a pool, and things like that. And I think what Marriott's seeing is you're, you know, that enables them to kind of merge the two in ways that uh, other property managers will, will struggle. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I think we're doing a nice, a nice job. I, I do think when we, it goes back I, again, I think the loyalty programs are going to be really important. Um, and, and that's a struggle. That's not something that's done easy. Just ask Expedia. Uh, they know all about loyalty programs there. They've got three of them. Now they're trying to roll them all into one. Um, Airbnb hasn't yet come out with one, but I think they will. So, uh, but I do think, uh, you know, I think that Mark made a really good point about you've got to know who your guest is to really understand where your time is well spent in providing these ancillary um, ancillary amenities and deciding how to price them into, into your offering. And the last thing I'll say is I, I think that the OTAs in this industry, they've got to take a little bit of, of the lift here and making it easier for these hosts to promote the value add that they're bringing. And it's only in their best interest to do so because if they are getting higher ADR, like Eric talks about, and I have no doubt especially right now where you're probably talking a limited number of homes have got EV chargers. But I think it's across a host of different things that people are doing. Part of the problem though, is when you get into these markets where a large portion of their business is being driven by the channels, it's tough sometimes to promote that value add on the channels. And therefore you can end up, if you're not careful, costing yourself money because you're actually providing more and not getting that lift that Eric's talking about. So I, I think the OTAs, in order for this to really take, you know, to grow legs even further is they're going to have to step in, really identify what are those value adds that people are adding that are, they know it's golf carts, they know hot tubs does it, but they've got to go deeper. And frankly, I had this conversation with Beyond Pricing this past weekend at the Streamline Conference, they owe the industry um, to dig further into their algorithms about how do I correctly price my home with an EV charger or with these added amenities or local tours and attractions against a better comp set. Because right now they're really just leaving it to them to kind of set a base and then adjust from there. So we, we've just got to keep getting better. And I think all of those things, hotels have just had time to figure it out and their products a little easier to say, okay, all these units sit on this one piece of dirt, you know, they all got the exact same, but, but that doesn't mean we should keep trying because there's huge value there. Mm. 
Uh, thank you very much, Matt. We've got yep. probably just about enough time. Uh, we've had a couple of questions in from the audience as well. So I'll try and squeeze one, one last one in, at least in this short time. Uh, so we had a question in from Suzanne Mahoney and it says, um, it sounds like a complete no brainer for brands and hosts and their guests, but have you come up against challenges in onboarding them? And if so, how, how have you overcome them? Um, perhaps Annie, is that something that you would like to come in on there or uh, one of our other yeah. panel? <clears throat> I think for many hosts, uh, upsells and monetizing is a new customer behavior. You know, all of us have thought about it. I'm gonna leave that wine out, Venmo me. It's a nightmare. Oh, I need your cell phone, all that stuff, right? Um, so they stopped doing it. Um, so with onboarding now, I think one, you have to make it um, seem very similar to other things, other technology that people have onboarded and then support, right? I think all of us probably have support demo people that say, hey, you don't wanna do it, I can I can do it for you. That's not, that's not exactly scalable, but in the first couple of years, um, it's very helpful and also it provides a lot of learning for our team as well. Thank you very much, Annie. Um, we do also have one, one more question, but we're going to have a two minute uh, countdown towards the end. So I'd encourage our panelists, um, we've got a question here about uh, add-on revenue and what percentage of overall revenue is realistically incremental. Do you think there will ever be a time where incremental revenue overtakes the cost of the property rental? Um, I'm going to ask in that two minutes at the end if our panelists would like to come in on that and answer that for our, our guests um, tuning in today. But um, I don't know where all the time has gone. The hour has absolutely uh, flown by, but I'd like to thank uh, all of my um, speakers for their time and their insights today. Big thank you to Annie, to Eric, to Matt and to Mark. Uh, we've just got a couple of quick slides I'd like to run through as well before we finish. So we are back on Tuesday, the 27th of September for our next Rockstars webinar, and that's called The New Era of Smarter, Sustainable, Responsible Tourism. Another big issue that we'll be exploring uh, on Rockstars. So you can sign up now in the chat or scan uh, the QR code, I think, which is on the screen now. And you can also work with us too as well. Please contact my colleague, Katie, whose details are on screen for you now. Big thank you again to our sponsors, Price Labs and Minute for sponsoring our Rockstars series and session. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to keep the session open for another two minutes. Um, so if you want to jot down any details about our speakers that have been written down there, if our speakers would like to answer any of the questions additionally uh, that came up during the conversation, then please do uh, feel free to uh, answer them before we close the Zoom. Uh, and do contact us via our various channels as well. So I'd like to thank our speakers once again uh, who and everyone who tuned in today, and we'll see you all again next time. Thank you very much, everyone.